Men, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard someone say, or you may have said yourself, and you can never understand a woman. <clears throat> and humanly speaking, that's probably true. But in the Christian marriage, God doesn't give us that option, does he? In fact, we are not allowed not to understand. Uh, the Bible tells us that our very prayer life is affected by our understanding or lack thereof of our wives. The first epistle, uh, Peter, he writes, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. We need to understand what our wife needs, what her needs are. And so uh, we want to look at a few of those areas, just mention a few, we, this is nothing exhaustive at all, but she needs security. Uh, she needs emotional security. Just a couple of things that may help you here. Uh, first, we can provide emotional security by doing things with our wives, uh, doing things that she likes to do. Uh, we need to let her know that we understand her by learning what she enjoys, what gives her satisfaction, sharing the things that she delights in. Uh, and then we also need to help her feel secure by our awareness that uh, time is needed for emotional adjustment to change. Uh, and not a good idea, you know, for you to come running in on Friday afternoon and say, Honey, we're moving to Seattle next Saturday. Uh, you know, uh, it, it takes a little time to adjust to those things. And the initial emotion you get from that is probably not going to be affection and uh, warmth. Uh, you need to learn to protect her emotionally. We need to also learn to provide financial security. Now, financial security is not just uh, providing money and things and food and that kind of stuff, although that's part of the responsibility. Um, we need to take responsibility for the finances. Uh, it, it, you know, you don't just hand her a wad of money and say, here's your household money, make do. You know, and just leave everything up to her uh, with regard to that. But uh, you need to take the responsibility. Now, in a lot of marriages, the wife has a lot more gifts in that area than the husband does. Uh, they're able to handle finances. They're able to be frugal and, uh, and uh, deal with those kinds of things. And that, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's one thing if your wife has gifts and she enjoys doing those things. But there should never be a sense that she is pressured by the fact that you don't take your responsibility in those areas. Uh, we need to take fiscal responsibility seriously. Uh, your, your wife may be able to handle the mechanics of it a lot better than you, and that's fine. But you are responsible for leadership in that area. We need to provide our wives physical security. Uh, physical security is communicated uh, in uh, part by uh, non-sexual touch. Uh, one uh, study has been done that uh, concluded that women need eight to ten non-sexual touches every day just to maintain emotional stability. And, uh, and we can affirm her and assure her of our care in that way. Uh, another way we provide physical security is through uh, recognizing that a uh, wife needs a nest. Uh, they, uh, they tend to ha need a place of refuge, a place that's my own. Um, Libby and I uh, had the privilege, as Eugene mentioned earlier, of traveling with Life Action Ministries for a number of years. We were uh, uh, in a motor home on the road. Uh, this was at age 50 for me. Uh, not the time you start some kind of adventurous life like this, but anyway, we, that's where God put us for a while. And uh, we were averaging about four or five setups a week with that motor home. We made 38 states in two years. Um, but every night when I'd set that thing up, plug in, turn the water on, Libby was inside making it her nest. You know, the pictures would come out, the color coordinated placed mats, the aromatic candles, you know, this, it was home. It was a refuge. 
and uh, and you need to be aware of that need now uh, she needs to feel secure in her nest and that won't be the case if the doors are falling off the hinges and the paint's peeling off the walls and you know you're not taking care of things you need to give her a sense of uh, physical security by making sure that the nest is well cared for uh, we need to provide spiritual security for our wives now, I know that ultimately her security is in Christ. Uh, we are not the security for our wives. We need to recognize that. She needs to recognize that. But uh, we need to let her see that we are serious and genuinely seeking the Lord. Uh, she needs to see that you have convictions that are grounded in Scripture. Uh, we need to distinguish between uh, conviction and preferences. You know, a lot of times we, we fight for our preferences, uh, but when it comes right down to it, we wouldn't be willing to die for them. Conviction is something you're willing to die for. And our wives need to know that, that we are seeking the Lord, that our convictions are grounded in Scripture, and we would die for some things. And those are things that uh, we have seen in God's Word. So uh, we need to know that uh, she needs security in several areas of her life. Uh, another thing that we need to know is that our wife needs communication. Um, one, one of the most important things we communicate is expressed in three simple words. I love you. Uh, I heard a story once of a couple that came in for marriage counseling. And... Uh, the counselor was listening to their uh, story, and the, and the wife says, so, you know, uh, we've been married for 29 years, and he's never told me he loves me. <laughs> and the husband said, I told her the day we got married. If I changed my mind, I'd let her know. <laughs> that, that won't cut it, guys. <laughs> they, we, we need to, they need to hear us say it. Uh, we need to use words and communicate with words. Uh, we need to learn to communicate with our words. We also need to learn to communicate in ways that are meaningful to her. Uh, Gary Chapman has done us a service in identifying these love languages. Uh, uh, everybody has ways that they express love and the way they receive expressions of love best. And you need to know uh, what your wife uh, values and treasures. Some uh, express their love by giving gifts. Uh, when Libby and I first got married, uh, we'd, uh, after children came along, you know, we'd go off somewhere and be gone for three or four hours and be headed back home and she'd have to stop and get something to take home, give to the children. And I, it didn't make, I didn't, what's going on here? And it took me a while to figure that out, you know, that that's the way she says I love you. She gives gifts. Uh, she just, everywhere she goes, you know, uh, with children and grandchildren and family and with me, uh, she just, uh, she loves to come in the house and say, bought you a surprise, you know. And that's her way of saying, I love you. Uh, some people express love by, by spending time with people. Others express love by uh, acts of service, doing things for you. Uh, some people express uh, love by uh, their words, affirming you with their words. Uh, and some with uh, physical touch and expressions. And we need to learn what communicates best with our spouse and express our love in those ways. Uh, but, you know, your wife also needs for you, as a part of this communication process, she needs for you to listen, uh, to, to pay attention. Uh, we, we men sometimes, you know, we're, we, we sort of... Uh, have tunnel vision or you know we're project oriented we get going on something and uh, we just don't really pay attention sometimes uh, we need to learn to listen to pay attention and we need to communicate that we are attentive to them uh, you know even in a huge crowd of folks with just a, a glance a gesture you know you, you can communicate to your wife you know I have a thousand people here but you are the most important person in this room to me you know uh, so just giving attention, paying attention, uh, listening. Uh, I, one of the uh, uh, 
things that scripture says about our, the relationship of marriage is that our wives have authority over our bodies. And I know that's written in the context of a conjugal relationship and marriage, but I think it probably includes our voice and our ears too. You know, we need to pay attention to them and give them uh, the attention that they need in that communication. Learn, learn to communicate. Uh, our wives need to be honored. Uh, to honor someone need, means to give weight, value uh, to them. Uh, and it's expressed in, in some uh, rather simple ways, really. Uh, one of the ways we express that honor is through good manners. Uh, yeah, have you ever seen royalty open doors for themselves? Uh, you know, or pull out their chair from the table? <clears throat> they are honored by having that done for them. And that's one of the ways we can honor our wives, you know, just by having good manners, by doing simple expressions of, of uh, courtesy like that. Uh, we're gonna see a little later on that, uh, that courtesy and good manners are one of the characteristics of biblical love. Um, and so we should treat our wives like royalty. Uh, I used to kid Libby about that a lot. Uh, and uh, then we began to research her uh, ancestry. She's an Irish McCarthy and found out they were a noble family. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, she's my queen. And so I try to treat her uh, with the honor that is due. Uh, we can express this with unexpected acts of kindness. Uh, you know, offer to do the dishes, make a bed, uh, take care of the children, without being asked or her having some pressing need that you've got to do it. Giving weight uh, to her opinions, her thoughts. Um, think of the sound advice that was offered to some men in scripture that they ignored. Men like Pontius Pilate and, uh, and Nabal. You know, it, we need to pay attention. It, our wives are not infallible, but they are God's gift to us a suitable helper. We need to give weight and attention, honor them in those ways. Another uh, need that our wives have is that she needs to be understood. Uh, we need to learn to discern where she's coming from. Uh, when, when your wife speaks, uh, she often responds first with her emotions but she also operates out of her will and her intellect and her spirit. And, and we, need to, we need to know where she's coming from. Wives were created to be nurturers, to be caregivers, uh, and, and they have that uh, strong uh, aspect of who they are. Um, I, I like to illustrate this with the story of a, a newlywed couple that had been on their honeymoon, they came back home, and. Uh, they go to church for the first time as a newlywed couple. They're walking down the uh, hall uh, right before Sunday school and a nursery worker steps out and greets them and congratulates them. And, and she says to the wife, so, you know, we, we need some extra help in the nursery. We'd love to have you come and help us out in the nursery. And uh, she wants to be polite. She says, well, we'll, we'll pray about it. And uh, I'll talk to my husband and we'll get back to you. And they go in the hallway and, and she turns to him and said, I don't want to be in the nursery, I want to be with you in Sunday school. He said, that's fine, whatever you want to do. And so they go in Sunday school and church and they get home having lunch that day and was sitting there and all of a sudden she says, you know, I never had any younger brothers or sisters, I never babysat or anything like that. If I were to help out in Sunday school, I could learn from those ladies how to take care of children. And he said, that's fine, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. So they go through the rest of the day, and that night they're getting ready to go to bed, and she says, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna do that nursery thing. I, I need to be with you. I'm, I'm your wife, and, and uh, I need to be with you. And he says, well, yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, just you decide. Next day he's at work, and he gets a phone call from his wife, and she says, honey, I just called Ms. Jones, told her I'd take that nursery job. <laughs> Now, to the husband, this woman just cannot make up her mind. She's just bouncing off the wall. But to her, she's just logically working through the process. Her first response was an emotional response. I don't want to be in there. I want to be with my husband. 
And then she began to work with her intellect, you know, think through this, say, hey, this, this would be a good thing. I could learn from this, you know. And then she begins to make a decision with her mind and her will, and she says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay with my husband. And the next day, she gets convicted, and she operates spiritually. She says, I ought to do this. They need the help. So, I mean, she's just working through the process. You know, the difference between men and women is that women talk all the way through the process. Men generally like to you know, work it all out, and then they tell you where it is. You know, this is the conclusion. Uh, and, and there's a danger, guys, because, see, if, if, you, if you start learning to communicate and, and you start talking and you begin to talk about the process you're going through, if you're not careful how you word it, you'll get down the road and you'll come to the conclusion. They say, but you said, and they'll go back to where you started, you know. So you got to learn to communicate. And that means not only saying the words and hearing the words, but understanding and making sure that you know where each other is coming from and what's really being communicated. Part of that is that, uh, men, we have to learn to speak womanese. Uh, <laughs> sometimes uh, our mates speak in a, a different language. Um, have you ever had your wife ask your opinion about something and then get mad when you gave it? Uh, you know, come in, should I wear the red dress or the green one? Or oh, the red one? Well, what's wrong with the green one? Well, nothing. Wear the green one. You know, no, you don't like the green one. What's wrong with it? I want to know why you don't like it. Well, you see, the, the problem is she wasn't asking for your opinion. She wanted to talk about it. She wanted to dialogue about you know, what she was going to wear you know, on that occasion. And uh, you, you probably should have said something like, well, well I didn't, they're both nice. What, which one do you think you should wear? You know, and then you talk about it. Um, but uh, sometimes... Uh, Wives will say the opposite of what they really mean uh, because they want you to understand and, and work with them. Uh, you know, you, uh, you may be home on Saturday, you know, and you're piddling around the house. You've got to run to the hardware store or something. You can come through the kitchen and say, honey, I've got to run to the store and pick up something. You want to ride with me? No, I, I won't go this time. And what she really means is, I'd love to go, but I want to know that you really want me to go, so ask me again. You know, you, you got to know where they're coming from, what the heart is behind what they say. Um, you may have, uh, on occasion, you know, arranged to take her out for a nice uh, dinner or something. You know, you even got the babysitter and got everything all fixed up, and you're getting ready to go, and she's putting on the final touches, and you say, well, "Honey, where do you want to go tonight? You want Chinese, Mexican? But, well, it really doesn't matter." Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> but she wants you to know and to understand and to have, you know, uh, empathy, and, and she wants to talk about it. So. Uh, learn to hear not just what she says, but what she means. Learn to discern her motivation, where she's coming from. Uh, she needs to have you communicate with her. And, and that's a job for us sometimes. Uh, it requires some change and some death to self and uh, some adaptation. She needs to be loved. In fact, this is probably her most basic need and her greatest need to be loved. And that is precisely what Paul commands the husbands to do uh, when we get into that section of Ephesians 5. But I want to just give some general uh, observations before we get specifically to the role of the husband. Love denotes the Christian. It, it's godly love that sets us apart from everyone else, from unbelievers. And uh, this should be nowhere more evident than in the marriage relationship, in the family, in the home. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Uh, think about some of these characteristics of love. Uh, love is demonstrative. God demonstrates his love and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Love is everlasting. Because God has loved us with an everlasting love. Love is inclusive. God loved the world, so loved the whole world. Love is exclusive. God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Love is whatever God is. Because God is love. 1 Corinthians 13 says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love... Just a noisy gong, clanging cymbal. If 
I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Without love, all I say is nothing. This noisy gong, plain and simple. Without love, all I am is nothing. Without love, all I do profits me nothing. Just what is this love then? Let's consider uh, biblical definition of love. Love is defined for us in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. It is not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable, not resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things, and love never fails. Uh, several of these words, these descriptive words, uh, lend additional insight when we study them a little closer. I want to dig a little bit deeper into these uh, words as we just think about the whole concept of biblical love. Love is patient. I have to ask myself, am I patient with my mate, with my children? Do I take what is dished out without retaliation and without uh, giving God a time frame to remove it and set it right? Am I kind? Uh, kindness is not just the absence of meanness. Uh, our love is to be like Christ's love. Scripture tells us that His Kindness is great, it's marvelous, it's merciful, it's everlasting. He is active toward us in his kindness to us. Love doesn't envy. You say, I don't envy my mate. But when your spouse is praised by people at church, do you want to set the record straight, tell them what you live with? It's envy. Love does not boast. You know, boasting really is just self-righteousness. And you know what God, Christ said about that in the lives of the Pharisees. And in fact, he said that the very entrance into the kingdom is the opposite of that. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's no arrogance. Love is not puffed up. It's not conceited. By the way, this little aside Nagging is an expression of pride. I want my way. Love doesn't act like that. Love is not rude. A British preacher, Roy Hessian, used to say that courtesy is love in little things. Love has good manners. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. Paul writes to the Philippians, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Love is not irritable, not easily provoked. Am I provoked by my spouse, my children? I get irritated, get exasperated. Uh, I i got time to share this, I think. Uh, we, we were going to show you a, a video one night, but uh, it, it wasn't a high resolution enough to, to really show on the screen because it was in a foreign language and had subtitles, but it was such a wonderful uh, truth. Uh, There's a picture of a man and his son sitting on a bench out in the park in front of a what looked like a home for elderly. 
And they're sitting there and the son's reading the paper and the father's just sitting there. And a little bird flies into the bush and the father says, what's that? And the son says, it's a sparrow. He goes back to his paper and a few minutes later the bird lights in another place and the father says, what's that? The son says, it's a sparrow. And this goes on several times times, you know, it's a tendency as we get older to repeat ourselves. Uh, we forget we just asked that question and got the answer. And the father asked again and the son got ex exasperated and just blew up at his dad and the dad got up and walked off and said, where are you going? And the father was gone a few minutes and he came back and had a little book in his hand. And it was a diary. And he opens it up, hands it to his son and says, read. The son looked at it, he said, out loud. The son begins to read, and it's the account his father wrote. And he says, today I took my son to the park. He asked me 21 times what this sparrow was, and every time I patiently answered him, a sparrow. Patience, kindness, not getting exasperated and irritated, provoked. Just remember how patient God was with you and still is. Uh, not resentful. Love is not resentful. It, it, King James says, thinks no evil. Uh, that's an accounting term. Uh, it has to do with keeping records. Love doesn't keep records. And one of the things that uh, I, I've learned uh, recently, uh, writing by uh, Jay Adams on forgiveness and being forgiven and learning to forgive, and uh, he says that you know when you forgive someone, you make a promise. You make a promise never to bring it up again to them. You make a promise never to bring it up again to anybody else. You make a promise never to bring it up again to yourself. Love doesn't keep records of wrongs. And most of us have this catalog in the back of our mind. And we have the accurate record of every offense. And whenever conflict comes, we whip it out and we start flipping through the pages and say, you never, you always, and we got the record. That's not love. And forgiveness promises never to do that. It's not thinking evil, it's not resentful, it's not keeping a record of wrongs. Does not rejoice at wrongdoing. You say, I, I don't rejoice at wrongdoing. It, but what do you watch on television? What do you read in books and magazines? Do you fill your mind with stuff that's questionable? Love rejoices in the truth. Is God's word really central in your home? Love bears all things. D do I bear with difficulty or do I just say, man, I just can't take it anymore. Love believes all things. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, that people whom we love, who are, we count as dear friends and close, we hear something bad about them, we say, I can't believe that. I know that person. But if it's somebody that we're not really close to, we kind of got a itch in our bonnet about them anyway. You know, and somebody says something. I thought there was something there. You know, we're quick to believe. But love doesn't believe the worst. Love hopes. It never gives up hope that they'll be different, that they'll change, that God will work in their lives. Love endures all things. Uh, do I accept what comes as from the hand of a sovereign and good God? Or do I look for somebody to blame, get bitter? And then finally, love never fails. Do I consistently do what God expects of me? Well, that's what love looks like. And God has said husbands are to love their wives. 
Love is depicted for us in Christ. I, that command that Paul gives, he says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And, you know, it, it, we would love it if he just said, husbands, love your wives. Oh, I do. I, 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 you know, I just love her. I worship the ground that woman walks on. But he said, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And he said, yeah, I, 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 would, I would die for her. <laughs> and he goes ahead and he says, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He, he not only would, he did. And if we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church, we must die in their behalf. That means death to ambition and to self and to hobbies and to all kinds of things that would get in the way of putting them in the proper place in our lives. So let's think about how Christ depicts this love in the way he loves his church. First of all, he initiated the relationship. Christ loved us first. Uh, scripture says not that we love God, but that he loved us. He initiated the relationship. He died for us. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we must die to self and to ambition, to career, uh, to whatever stands in the way of doing for our wives what we should be doing. Christ intercedes for us. Uh, Hebrews 7.25 says that uh, he is able to save us to the uttermost because he ever lives to intercede for us. He is constantly interceding for us before the Father. And as we are to be an expression of his love in our relationship with our wives, just like prayer and intercession characterizes him, it should characterize us. We should be praying, interceding for our wives. He strengthens us. Uh, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everything God calls us to do, the power of God is there present in Christ to do it. And we must encourage our wives and hold them up, give them strength, give them encouragement. He provides for us. And Paul says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We are to be providers for our wives. Uh, Paul he wrote to Timothy, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he's denied the faith. He's worse than an unbeliever. Christ not only provides our needs, but also a lot of our wants. And we need to provide for our wives. He comforts us. God is a God who comforts us in all our tribulations. And our Lord comforts us both as leader and as protector. The psalmist says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Our leadership in the home, our role of authority and rulership in the home should not be a burden. It should be a rest. It should be a comfort, not a conflict. Uh, Jesus says to us, you know, all you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke on you. Work with me. And you'll find rest for your soul. When, when our wives are alongside us as suitable helpers, you know, that role of headship and leadership should be a bur not be a burden. It should be a comfort and an encouragement to them. Uh, he comforts us. He calls us his friend. Uh, he said to his disciples the night before he was crucified, all things that I heard from my father I've made known to you. A friend shares his life with his uh, friends. Jesus said, you know, it, all of it, I've shared with you. Um, one of the most wonderful things about a marriage relationship is when that relationship is a friendship. Um, Libby and I were very fortunate in the way God brought us together and the path that we took into that. For a couple of years, we grew and developed as friends uh, after we'd gotten to know each other, before we ever became romantically involved. And so there was a, a deep friendship established when we began to uh, be drawn to one another and eventually were married. 
And that has continued through the years. We, we share things, we do things together. We, we share common interests and we find things that, that we both delight in. And we also learn to delight in what the other enjoys doing. Uh, you know, I, I've enjoyed getting involved in her uh, hobby that she's picked up in the last uh, oh, seven or eight years. She's become a quilt maker. Uh, I don't know, 40 some she's made in, in the last uh, eight years. And uh, uh, I don't sew, but I love to uh, in, be a part of uh, color choices and design and figuring out the mathematics of how you cut a square in half and make triangles out of it, but it comes out the right size when you sew them back together and, you know, how you uh, figure angles and circles and, you know, it, it can be a fun thing to do together. And, you know, you can even learn, guys, and, and I know you're probably going to turn me off after I say this, you can learn to enjoy taking your wife shopping and just watching the delight and the joy that she has in that. And, and you'll especially enjoy it when she develops what Libby has developed, and that's the ability to go get $70 clothes for $15 and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but it can be fun to watch your wife do something that you know is a delight to her. But we need to be friends and share our lives together. And uh, uh, you know, Libby is my best, most intimate friend. And, uh, and that continues to grow and to develop. So, you know, study and discover ways that you can share life together as friends. Uh, Christ gives us his name. Uh, he said that uh, we could ask the Father in his name. That, you know, that's our legal standing before the Father now. And, uh, and we can go to the Father in Christ's name. Uh, you know, a time was in, uh, in America when uh, a family name was something important. Uh, uh, I can remember as a child, you know, uh, hearing parents say to their children, uh, we don't do those things, we're Oldhams. You know, that kind of, that was something that was not to be associated with the family name. Uh, and I saw that, uh, the fruit of that borne out in my father. My father was, uh, uh, he was not, uh, I mean, you think of what a politician is, the polar opposite. Uh, my dad was not a politician. Uh, never crossed his mind to run for public office. Uh, uh, he just, uh, just not who he was. He was a quiet, patient man, loved to laugh. Uh, but my dad was elected to the town council because it, we were going through a time where there was corruption and graft and, and just all kinds of stuff going on in the town government. And everybody in Clayton knew my dad had integrity. He had a name, he had a reputation. And we need to provide that kind of name for our wives. When they take our name, it needs to be a name that is a name of integrity, a name of value, a name that uh, she can wear uh, with pride and honor. So, uh, Christ loves us and we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Final aspect of that, Christ is inseparably attached to his bride. If you don't know the last few verses of Romans 8, you need to memorize that passage. It is wonderful. There is nothing in all of creation, and he goes through and lists a bunch of things, you know, just powers and nothing, death itself, nothing will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ. That's the relationship Christ has with his bride. And our wives need to know that we are that committed to them, that we will never leave them, we'll never divorce them, we'll never forsake them. We mentioned earlier the verse in uh, Hebrews that we're God says to his people, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's quoting the first chapter of Joshua, where he makes that promise to Joshua. And uh, again, the Greek language does stuff that uh, we don't do in English. There are five negatives in that phrase uh, where he says, no, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, we, we don't do that in English, but we, uh, we sang a, a verse a while ago that 
almost gets it right in English. He says, the soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will, I'll never, I will not, I will not forsake to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. That's God's love for us. That's Christ's relationship to his bride. And that will be our relationship to our bride. Well, we are commanded by God's word to live in relationship with one another. Husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Wives submitting themselves to their husbands as to the Lord. That's the first step of establishing a godly home, a godly marriage. Before we ever get around to thinking about children, you know, that's the first step, learning to live in that kind of relationship. That's what God created us for. He created man, male, and female, and said, you leave father and mother, cleave to one another. That's how you're to live. You're to be one. That's his purpose in creation. And it's still his purpose in recreation. We're to be a reflection of who he is. We're to look like Christ and his bride, the church, and have that inseparable relationship of love and submission in the home. Let's pray together. Father, we recognize that uh, none of this is possible apart from your grace, your mercy, your love, and no human being can attain such a life. But by your grace, the power of your spirit at work in us, in submission to the truth of your word, we can be a reflection of who you are to the world around us. And oh, how this land needs such a picture of godly homes. Father, forgive us for buying into the world's lie about what marriage should look like and how it should be lived out. Draw us back to you and to your way and to your word. Cause us to live as husbands, as wives, as fathers, as mothers, as grandparents, as children, as a reflection of the Creator God who purposed that His glory would be seen in us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.